Nitin Rakesh needs no introduction, joins us right now with his sense of how the fundamentals of the market are shaping up. Nitin, good having you. Thanks so much for joining in. Uh, you know, I'll actually start off with something which is a bit more of a trading question, Nitin. Uh, last, last 7 to 14 trading sessions, it's pretty much become a market wherein it's just so easy to initiate a short one day and wait for the market to go down, if not that very day, then maybe in the next couple of days. We've corrected almost from 5200 all the way to 4850 from in, in this fashion. What happens now? Do you believe the pressures around the world are strong enough to take us even further lower from these levels or could there be a pullback? I think there is a fair amount of uh, you know, news flow headline, in, you know, bad news that could push you down to the previous lows that we saw way back in 2011 December. Uh, so it's not really uh, you know wise idea to predict what the bottom will be. You know it will be when we you know when we see it established. Uh, but I think clearly what's also happening is that with every decline, uh, you know you're getting more and more parity between things like the earnings yield and the and the bond yield. So clearly markets getting into a zone where at least from a valuation perspective, you know it starts looking interesting. Uh, especially if you start looking at you know individual stock names, you know with with names like HDFC and, uh, and you know correcting yesterday sharply, I think you, you can start seeing ideas that that start coming up based purely on the price decline. So I think it's 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 hard to predict what the bottom is going to be. Uh, are we close to it? You know, are we going to see more value destruction? But I think it's very uh, interesting to see how, from a, a longer term perspective, you start seeing valuations that uh, that are pretty interesting. Right. Uh, and when you, you know, when you're talking about interesting valuations, what's the kind of uh, band of uh, valuations that uh, draws your interest, given that the market is trading at roughly about, you know, 11 to 12 times one year forward? So clearly, I think if you see, uh, you know, if I if I continue to focus on the FY13 Sensex earnings, you know, at 1250 odd number, you know, with Sensex being at 16,000, you know, we are really, uh, you know, going closer and closer to to the 10, 11 mark. Mm. Uh, historically, you know, it's, uh, markets don't sustain for a very long period of time below below these kind of valuations. Uh, having said that, you know, uh, the bigger question really is: Are these earnings going to be intact, or are you going to see a further downgrade? You know, for uh, for now, at least as of now, we are, we think that 1250 is an achievable number. So about 10, 10, 12 percent earnings growth for FY13 is is achievable. Uh, but again, there's so much new, you know, negative news flow from global macro, domestic macro that you know traders are having a field day shorting the market. So you know, it's uh, it's, it's just momentum playing out for that. Okay, but just uh, just a small update uh, before we get back to Nitin on power grid. Uh, I believe, uh, in fact, the PTI is saying that the World Bank is going to give a sanction of 13,000 crores for an infra development of power generation facilities in northeast, which would be executed by Power Grid Corporation of India. So maybe, just maybe, watch out for this one. The uh, PTI is reporting it will come up on the screens, the news on the flashes as well. Power Grid uh, as could get excited as a result of this. Uh, okay, Nitin, uh, broadly, you, you mentioned about earnings and the kind of impact that it could have uh, for our markets. Uh, assuming that the scenario isn't too bad on the global front, do you believe the next three months or the next two months provide an opportunity to maybe go out and do select cherry picking within the large caps in India? And is that also... Can you extend that argument for the mid-cap end as well, which has actually taken a bigger battering than the large caps? I think we are, as I said, you know, uh, definitely you, you are starting to see some of those uh, interesting valuations throw up on a stock-specific basis. Uh, again, if you are a believer in, uh, in long-term portfolio building, then this is as good a time as you can get. You know, when the market is greedy, uh, you, know, you have to be fearful mm -hmm. and vice versa. So we are in a mode where everybody is so fearful of equities. Uh, globally, the sentiment is pretty, uh, you know, pretty poor. So, you know, it feels like the market is 16,000, but the sentiment is 6,000. <laughs> so, I think, uh, you know, one has to look at uh, these opportunities as, as and when they crop up. So, it's definitely a stock-specific uh, play right now. Uh, once we see a little bit of movement on the macro front, we can then say, okay, you know, there's a broader call on the, on the, on the top-down market itself. But I think for now, you have to continue to focus on where you can find value and, and, and how you can pick these things up that otherwise you won't be able to. Well, where is the focus right now in accumulating large caps in this fall or, you know, cherry picking some of the mid cap names? As I think it's not so much a discussion from our point of view about large cap versus mid cap. I think it's really about the quality of earnings, the predictability of earnings, the pricing power that the companies have, the, uh, you know, the ability for them to withstand the next six, eight, ten months of pain. Uh, can they pass on a lot of their pain, you know, to the end consumer in terms of their pricing and maintain their margin? So, if you can find those in mid caps, you, sh you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't be buying those names. And you know, you can find uh, not too many, but you can still find uh, you know enough companies to build a decent portfolio. 
So sectorally, uh, there is no uh, a particular pocket that uh, convinces you? I think uh, private sector banks clearly, you know, in a crack, you should go and lap them up, otherwise they seem very expensive. Uh, consumer names, uh, you know, l some auto names are still pretty interesting. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of uh, continuing to play the currency through the export sector. So I think, uh, you know, given that we are in a situation where rupee seems to be in a, in a long-term correction, you know, after, having, after 10 years, you know, we're actually seeing some real uh, economic-related correction in the rupees. So I think all of that adds a lot of comparative muscle to, to a lot of these businesses. IT would be on your uh, Absolutely. So I think IT outsourcing is clearly something you must have in your portfolio because you're going to benefit from, uh, from the currency impact that they get. Obviously, you know, assuming that they're not fully hedged, as Interesting you say that losses. because you know on the sell side a lot of people are holding the view that post the earnings IT is really not a theme that you should play on given the visibility and the uh, toughness of the environment globally. But on the buy side most fund managers are actually looking at IT. Absolutely stuff. again you know if you see the models that were built on 52 rupees, 51 half, 50, I mean that all of those assumptions will, will get revisited every quarter and, and obviously you know um, not to... Uh, not to say anything against the sell side guys, but they have a view on a quarterly basis, you know, whereas some of these, some of the guys on the buy side take a view much more on a you know, one to three year basis. So I think, and again, you have predictability of earnings at least. Uh, you have quality of earnings. You have some upside potential because even if it's because of currency, uh, you know, you have an annuity business stream coming out of these businesses. Mm -hmm. So clearly, I think there are opportunities uh, that you can't ignore in that space. Uh, you know, you much rather play uh, play through these businesses rather than a commodity business, for example, because you know there are many more variables in a commodity business that you can't predict today. I'll, I'll try to nail it down to certain very liquid pockets right now, Nathan. One is capital goods, and if you saw what's really happened to the well, the two largest companies, uh, the body language is probably positive from L&D's front, but maybe the market doesn't believe it. BHL is trading at some new lows. Forget the mid caps; they are trading at abysmally low levels. Good time to accumulate? Or? Uh, I think uh, capital goods probably is a little different from the other infrastructure pack from the point of view that at least they have decent cash flows and decent visibility and not high amounts of leverage as, as there is in the infra space. So definitely if, uh, if price cracks, I think it's not a bad idea to accumulate some of the larger cap capital goods names. Uh, we were also a little surprised by the, uh, by the order flow that uh, the, at least the projection that LND gave, but I think we need, one needs to wait and watch as to how this pans out and if there's, uh, there's more build up in the order book. But you wouldn't touch the smaller ones? Uh, smaller ones, no, we actually were staying away from the so-called interest rate sensitives or the high beta names because uh, you know, while we, uh, you know, we answer a lot of tough questions from investors in Jan, Feb when that was in <laughs> flavor, I think uh, we stand vindicated as, at least as of now. So I think we need to see Definitely uh, falling off of interest rates. We need to see some of the balance sheet repairing work that needs to get done based on the high interest costs, and then we can decide what the next course of action should be. So it's a no to mid-sized capital goods, no to infra. You mentioned you will go out and lap up some of the private banks if there is a crack. What about mid-sized PSUs? Or contrary, even, conversely, even the large-sized PSUs, because some of them are trading at what? Sub, a, sub 1, 0 0.8, 0 0.75 book as well. Is it uh, tempting enough? Yes, but uh, PSU is a little scary word right now. So uh, I think a uh, uh, little more work needs to get done before we get comfortable or the, or the street gets the credibility back in the PSU names. Not just banks. I mean, across the board, PSUs have actually paid the price for being PSUs. Hmm. Um, and in some cases, for good reason. I mean, if you see the banking pack, you know, barring maybe two or three PSU banks large, um, most of them have actually taken a pretty big provisioning hit in the p and at least so far they've provisioned for large numbers. So... Yes, valuations are one part, but I think just because they're cheap doesn't make them attractive. Uh, you know, one has to have com comfort in the books. One has to have credibility behind the fact that, yes, you're, you've seen everything that was to be seen and then, then go in. Uh, you spoke about autos. Uh, between two-wheelers and four-wheelers, uh, where is the preference? Uh, definitely two-wheelers, purely because I think there is still a certain consumption element to them. There is a rural play you know, in, in, in there. There is an export play in there, at least in, in, in one of the names. So clearly you have a lot bigger hedge than, than pure interest rate type play. Just, uh, I mean, last uh, few questions, Nitin. Just scanning the how the numbers have been, because we started off this discussion based on how you believe earnings would essentially shape up or rather drive what the markets do and what specific stocks do. Based on quarter four, and it was not the best of quarters, is there anything that you caught your eye and said that, hey, never mind what happens to the markets, just looking at the kind of trajectory that is coming from this sector or this sector of stocks, they are probably worth a deco. 
See, clearly, as I said, I think wherever the, you believe that the companies have pricing power, they have decent cash flows, they don't have a lot of gearing on the balance sheets. I think those are the signs that you look for when you start making an investment decision. Hmm. And, uh, you know, if, if a company has the ability to, to protect its margins, uh, pass on the price. I mean, ITC is a classical example, right? Despite all the bad news, the stock is still, you know, 25-30% higher than where it was two months ago. Uh, despite the changes in budget when it got passed and so on and so forth. So I think those are, are great names to hold in a market like this. Mm. Uh, so clearly defensives, or as the market calls them, consumer staples, uh, debt-free companies, uh, you know, export-led companies. I mean, that's really what the universe is that we're looking at right now.